Before we dive into this uh, big battle of, of legal and business systems, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So, Ronick, if you could start, tell us a little bit about what you do at Pantheon. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Ronick Ray. I'm the general counsel of Pantheon. Uh, I've been here for just over 18 months. Uh, started the legal team from uh, just me. Uh, we're now up to 10 people globally. Um, and it's been quite fun. We've uh, established a, a good infrastructure for the company to scale out. Uh, Judas, over to you. Thanks, appreciate it. My name is Judas Cruz. I am the director. I'm sorry. Can everybody hear me? Okay, so yep. I'm, okay, thanks. I'm Judas Cruz, director of business systems at Revelize. Um, been at the company, I believe this is going on my 16th year there. So uh, when we started, it was a founder owned and led company. It has now been acquired by TA Associates and added to a portfolio of about eight other companies that uh, are, have all been recently acquired. And uh, so we've grown quite a bit over the time. And uh, I think we're over well over 200 employees now, but uh, and growing. So. I oversee implementation, transformation initiatives, and drive operational excellence across our entire uh, system stack. So, Thank you, guys. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Becky Holloway. I head up marketing at Malbec. Um, I am the creative voice behind the brand that uh, is known for wine and the color purple. And uh, we're really excited to be here today to talk to you about modern contract management, but we really believe that the lessons to be learned here in this debate are uh, really applicable to multiple areas of legal tech. So I'm sure you can apply these to whatever uh, technology issues you're facing right now as you're dealing with um, business systems. So let's begin with round one. I'm realizing I need like a bell sound effect. So you can, I guess, just imagine the, the ringing of the bell. And we're going to start with you, Ronick. So um, we all know what they say about assuming, right? And <laughs> I had fun titling this slide. Ronick, this one is one of the first gripes that you brought up when we were preparing for this showdown. So I was wondering if you could share some examples of how you've experienced being put in a box and what happens when requirements are assumed by someone outside of your team. My, uh, thank you, Becky. Um, my favorite uh, introduction is this is legal. They have some legal stuff to think about and help us through. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because when you uh, engage with the legal team as if they're in a box, uh, it's very difficult for legal to engage beyond uh, the box. So I, I challenge uh, you know, uh, everyone in this team who's working on transformation projects, working with legal um, on uh, asking questions, requirements is about asking questions and learning uh, to to not have assumptions going into those conversations. So you think about, you know, it's ironic to say like lawyers don't uh, end up in a box. Uh, we we look at four corners of a document, sure, every day, depending on how the situation evolves, we might uh, start thinking more outside those boundaries. But, um, you know, the modern lawyer today is creative, uh, is thinking about business impact and value. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we come from different backgrounds, different life experiences. You know, some of the lawyers that I know are musicians and uh, artists. They're, you know, they have very, um, they have other <laughs> alternatives outside of the, the work space that actually makes them quite compelling as uh, you know thought partners to think through requirements to think through uh, how legal can uh, not just as a as a team as a department drive value uh, but what the business can do that is under tapped um, so yeah I do I would say um, uh, putting legal in a box puts the entire team uh, at a disadvantage because you you are uh, starting off with a, a, a more standoff approach, and that uh, that could lead to some things that uh, just were not intended. Uh, legal tends to think about things differently, which is at, which adds diversity into uh, the thought process, adds value to the team, uh, and without it, it could uh, you know it could harm uh, the the outcome and the results. 
So I, I definitely can appreciate that comment about lawyers having other interests. And, you know, we've definitely in our space seen plenty of lawyers who are also entrepreneurs as well. So uh, quite well taken. So Judas, uh, on the flip side of this, business systems can feel like getting the requirements from legal in order to solve an issue with technology is not a straightforward process. And I loved this image because no one likes going to the dentist, let's be honest, right? So legal says they want you to know the requirements, but what do you experience when you try to actually understand their use cases? Yeah, so thank you, appreciate that, Becky. So, you know, when we say gathering requirements like pulling teeth, it's not to say that uh, legal doesn't want to help us help them uh, oftentimes, but, uh, you know, honestly, they do own the requirements a lot of times. and. Um, Sometimes we have found that uh, when we're working with legal uh, and solving a problem that are more that they're more focused sometimes on solving the problem rather than identifying the actual solution that's both scalable and efficient across the business as a whole. Um, oftentimes they look for solutions or what we you know sometimes not all the time of course don't want to say all the time uh, we find that solutions that meet their immediate needs of today, but uh, sometimes they don't. Uh, necessarily scale for growth, right? Uh, or, or, or they're not usable across the entire system or stack uh, across the business. So in, in business systems, we like to think strategically, not just reactively, right? And so a lot of times when we're thinking strategically and we're trying to re uh, pull those requirements from the legal teams, um, we can be, uh, it sometimes can be some a bit challenging. So when we try to work with legal, um, we try to also bring those ideas that are both strategic and solve the problem, not only for legal, but across the entire system and add benefit to all the users of the platform. And we try to have those conversations, you know, uh, to make sure that we're fleshing out the right solution uh, for the problem that's been identified. So I, I think that wasn't too bloody of an initial round. I think everyone's still kind of standing more or less, right? <laughs> But um, we could say that if you put legal in a box, we're all beautiful people. That's a good box to put legal in. I uh, like not, not for long. I like that. <laughs> so obviously, um, legal is very busy and you don't know what you don't know. So there's validity on both sides, right? Legal does struggle to find time for these extra projects and often getting your arms around the scope of what you need is a time consuming experience. Um, and this may sound ironic coming from a legal tech company, but um, at Malbec, we are firm believers that a technology solution to a problem will only succeed if you do that upfront work, right? The process mapping, playbook mm -hmm. analysis, things of that nature. Due diligence, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly. So you may have noticed that today's webinar subtitle was Frenemies or Friends. And we really can say that um, a modern CLM solution can turn frenemies into friends and help bridge that gap that often exists between legal and business systems or IT. Um, so with a modern solution, you can enjoy an intuitive ex uh, user experience that isn't gonna require extensive training to become a proficient user. You know, just like with our consumer products, right? Nobody had to show you how to use the features on your phones. It's just designed in a way so you can naturally grasp those features. Um, you know, with Malbec, we've incorporated Microsoft Word and email into the flow of the product. We all know that lawyers love their Microsoft Word and email, right? So you can continue using the applications you're already really comfortable with. And I'll also add that one of the biggest issues surrounding contract management is just finding them, right? Finding the contracts and the key pieces of information that's in them. And with Malbec's Google-like search and, and filtering, that's really just like shopping on Amazon. It's, it's simple, it's easy to get to the information you need. So just drawing it back to how the tech can help with some of these um, differences that exist between different teams. I don't know if you guys have anything you wanna add there about your experience um, with those aspects of the solution. I'd throw in um, like one of the one of the ways that we thought about a CLM was it could get uh, a non-technical team to adopt it and use it proficiently. There's no reason that we can't get other uh, participants across the company to uh, use it and use it really well. So legal was uh, in many senses the, the the shepherd, right? We we 
uh, we shot it across the bow. We, we ended up doing some of the solutions work internally uh, with our teams, but largely around this business case of wouldn't it be easier if we just thought about this uh, as, a, as a group, uh, but let's do the experimentation first uh, and, and be sure we pave the path for others to, to make it easier for them. And I think that's what the feeling ought to offer. Yeah. yeah, that's been our experience too. I mean, the, the, the user interface and having everything under one system, uh, anytime you're implementing systems like this, uh, kind of having, you know, being sensitive to the people inside and outside the organization that will have to interact with the systems, right, is, is so key. And um, and that user experience is crucial to whether, it'll, you know, high adoption or whether it's just another system everybody hates. <laughs> That's awesome. So we have a comment here. I've heard sales like putting legal in a box. Just wish they did these poke holes in it so we can breathe. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Jason. And we do have uh, some questions coming in. So I am going to hold questions until the end so that we can continue through. But please, as you have questions throughout, just put them in chat. We will be uh, saving some time at the end to get to your questions. So moving on to round two. So, um, any any of us less? I think Ronak Ro Ro just fell off his chair over there. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did we lose you, Ronak? It's yeah, just kidding. I hope I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the longest time, legal was viewed simply as a cost center within companies. Um, but I really think that's starting to change. Legal wants to be a strategic partner and really bring value to the organization, just like any other team. So, Ronak, what has prompted the transformation from cost center to value adder, in your opinion? And what are some of the ways that legal can bring true value to their organization? I think we've seen um, a lot of organizations approach the legal department with um, uh, maybe like some assumptions in mind, right? You're going to stop my deal. Uh, you're going to tell me why I can't promote someone, uh, why I need approval uh, three times from the same people <laughs> for the same act. And and what we, uh, I think if uh, those in the legal profession that have done this uh, have, have found frustration, I think with our own uh, ways of having to do things and maybe not being able to explain uh, Sarbanes-Oxley perhaps well enough, uh, being able to explain uh, the tax structure well enough, being able to explain, um, you know, what controls and risks we're trying to help preserve for the company. And I think that those are all, um, you think about all of that, that's that's largely based on business. Pantheon is a, a, a platform company uh, that delivers software services to its customers, yeah? Uh, but if we had chosen a very different path, if we had even chosen a 10% different path, the agreements would be fundamentally different. Uh, the the way we understand and tolerate risk would be very different. And you know what this gets back to is like legal to be effective uh, needs to understand the business, and it's the business decisions that are driving legal behavior. Uh, when uh, when I coach and maybe train modern lawyers, like new people to the team, those that are struggling with some of these issues. You always start with the business first, uh, and by doing so, it creates a stronger, um, stronger position for legal. Uh, that uh, these are going to be fundamentally things that people are just not thinking about. Uh, there's uh, leadership and uh, inquiry that the legal team can bring that is unique. Uh, that you know, we're just you know, we've walked into situations where uh, you know some uh, operations team thinks they've mastered everything, and the last checklist item is legal, can you review this contract? Can you tell us whether this is approved or not? And and you just missed so much value there, right? Because you didn't, you didn't really think through the issues. And sure, someone in the legal team can give you a checkbox and say, yeah, why don't you go for it? Uh, but you fundamentally missed, right, the value of the legal function if you assume that that's the function that we pr uh, provide to the company. Um, those that get us involved much earlier, we found uh, we're able to rationalize decisions a little bit better, poke holes uh, in their logic uh, to get them to a better answer. And that creates much more business value right up front without actually losing all that cost uh, and 
you know, putting legal in a position where we're, we're now in court or we're doing a dispute resolution where we just didn't want to do that in the first place. And right. Yeah, because a lot of these decisions are really business decisions. And so if you can involve legal early, then you can be aware of the risks that may be associated with those business decisions rather than working through all of the, the business aspects and then tacking legal on at the end. That's a good point. So one of the issues you deal with a lot, Judith, is that when a technology solution is being considered, only the current most pressing needs inform the decision. You've said that legal needs to think ahead, years down the road, and imagine how they might want to be conducting business. Yep. Uh, you mentioned this in the last, you know, that they're, they're thinking about now and not the future. Right. you give a practical example of what this might look like, the looking ahead as opposed to just the here and now? Yeah, so what I can say is like, and I'm just going to punch back a little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. So if we want to add value to the business, right, we have to be proactive instead of reactive. And that's what I think some of the challenges are. We need to see what's coming. We need, we need to have that I'm already on it kind of attitude. Um, you know, instead of having that, uh, we're always chasing to be reactive and uh, always feeling like we're one step behind. Um, it often results in systems and processes which increase the technical debt overall, and they're just not scalable. And now, uh, you know, once you, a lot of times what we have found because so reactive sometimes in the, so, in the past and some of the solutions aren't thought through completely beyond what is needed today, they end up being Band-Aid solutions, right? And oftentimes they're not even adopted by the very users that wanted them implemented in the first place. Yeah. So that doesn't really scale well with the business. It's, it's, it's honestly uh, becomes more technical debt and uh, expense instead of improving a process, we've actually now crippled it, right? So if we really wanna add value, we need to think about the future needs, right? Uh, more broadly, not just when legal's thinking about solution, it needs to be a more broadly thought solution, um, <clears throat> prepared with clearly defined requirements from legal and also, how does it affect the other business units? How does it complement their efforts? How does it help drive um, more um, more value for, for legal and for the entire organization, right? So we need legal to work with us to understand the scope of the solution, how it will be implemented, and the impact it'll have on the users across the, across the organization, and then how the system will be used and utilized across all the business units. Once we fully kind of scope out those solutions and requirements, we can start identifying, you know, what fits those those needs more accurately, and and that will help uh, legal to drive that that value much much uh, at a much higher rate than you know they would otherwise. So, and uh, we you know we want to be a partner with legal, right? We want to and we want to we want to drive that value across the organization, and we want to complement their efforts. But we have to be thinking more strategically uh, about when we're we're more reviewing some of these tech, you know, these these stack yeah. solutions. So yeah, so I can't help but um, laugh a little as you say that often. You know, these are band-aid solutions, and you know what is chosen doesn't even end up getting used by those who are picking it. Ronit, care to punch back on that one? <laughs> that looks easy. It's too easy. <laughs> You're gonna give me that one. All right. <laughs> It, legal can't respond to things where we're not brought in. Uh, we can't see past uh, walls, right? What we want is engagement. We want people to bring us in early enough. If you ask us, uh, if, uh, as, as I've uh, probably demonstrated here, legal can talk forever. If, if you just give us a microphone, uh, bring us in, right? Get a, give us the challenge and uh, we'll surprise you. Awesome. We'll get you out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that the role of legal is evolving and with change comes growing pains. There is going to be this uncomfortable transition period where old stereotypes linger and legal is still viewed as, you know, a, a money suck that lags behind. However, there are ways that technology such as a modern CLM can really help propel your legal team into the future. Um, I think the worldwide pandemic that we are all facing has really forced many legal teams to face that. I know we're, we're definitely seeing that where, you know, folks are sort of having to figure out, okay, well, what are we doing in this new, you know, work from home world, right? Are, are they able to pivot and adjust quickly? Uh, can they adapt to evolving needs? We hear a lot today about AI and how AI will impact jobs for lawyers. 
Um, the reality is AI isn't going to replace lawyers, but lawyers who don't use AI will be replaced. Legal has to start thinking about things like contract cycle times, using terms and conditions strategically in agreements, and quantifying contract risk across an entire portfolio. Um, things that AI does very well and where modern CLM can really give you a competitive advantage. So those are just some of my thoughts on this. Um, I don't know if you guys care to add anything to that. I think one uh, one area I'd say is imperative for uh, the legal team, and you're seeing much more of this now, uh, is legal doesn't say, uh, like other teams, that they deliver business value. We we, we show it uh, and the metrics that we use to demonstrate it speak more to uh, the ability for us to drive value. We talk about process, cycle time, uh, volume. Uh, you know, th this, is, this is how we deliver business value, but we have people focus on those metrics as opposed to just the words on, we're here to drive strategy. We're here to help you think ahead. Um, I, I think that, is where CLM tools can really be uh, impactful for legal teams really being able to sure, be sure that we can paint the full story of where the legal team is delivering an impact to the organization that isn't just based on uh, some back office function. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and I, I just have to say that, uh, you know, Malbec, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the, the, it's document as far as being able to give visibility across all the teams too, because as we integrate Malvik into some of the other systems like uh, Salesforce, for one, is how we, you know, it gives that visibility and it allows the legal team to actually make changes to some of those documents uh, behind the scenes and those clauses that you were kind of calling out there can automatically be applied on the fly and not really interrupt the workflow of the of the AEs and all the other people that have to create and, and send out these documents. So. Malbec has really been a game changer as far as its ease of use and visibility and giving that 360 degree view of the customer uh, to a lot of different teams across the organization. So uh, it's pretty, pretty nice. So. Yeah, great points. Thank you guys. So on to round three and back over to you, Ronick. So I think any of us less technical folks, folks have been there, right? Talking to an IT person and they're using terms and jargon that just goes over our heads, right? Um, it can make you feel inadequate or, you know, confused. Um, and quite frankly, it can make you just not want to deal with business systems at all. So, Ronick, how do you need business systems to talk to you and your team? Yes, English would be preferred. This is <laughs> this is one of those areas where you just like boxes and arrows, if you could just describe maybe talk uh, like most people do, this would be really helpful. Uh, we, we found, uh, you know, we, we talked about the legal team not conventionally being very technical. Yeah. Uh, and, and for us to be able to tell the story of why this system, why this process, why is it, uh, why is it so important for uh, the business to take this on? Uh, we can be advocates, right? But we need to be able to speak the same language. So if we can just agree that geek is not a language, uh, that would be really helpful. I think if we can agree that English is a common language, this would allow us to, I think, spread the, the, the gospel, the value out to other uh, parts of the business that maybe uh, business, business systems just doesn't talk to. The first and probably the foremost is if you want to know what a customer thinks about your service, talk to legal. We're the ones talking to customers, right? Almost on a daily basis. And we can tell you how do the customers get impacted by faster turnaround times, you know, better ability to deliver on value. That's where the value needs to go. And that's going to help us shape kind of the, the future of the company. Um, so I, you know, my, uh, my, my position is as much as you can uh, try to bring us in early, but make sure we have a common platform in which to do that. I saw you shaking your head there, Judas. Care to respond? <laughs> I'm going to go to the next slide. I'll, I'll respond. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> gotcha. So um, fair is fair. You can obviously level the same charge against legal, right? I mean, there's a reason for the word legalese. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, one of the other communication issues business system struggles with from legal is complaining when projects take longer than expected. 
So for this audience, help us to understand things don't just happen at the touch of the easy button, right? So can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, first off, I'm a bare fist fighter, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need padding. So I'm going to take both of those, uh, the last and um, this one kind of together. We'll move it together. But listen, I understand that technologists can be absolute wizards. <laughs> and it's understandable that you may find it hard to do, <laughs> hard to understand us at times. <laughs> but let's be brutally honest here, right? Like, does anyone actually read contracts? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most have to be rewritten multiple times, so they can't be read by almost anyone. <laughs> There's some lawyer talk for you. <laughs> so let's break it down, right? A good strategy will drive revenue, will drive revenue right? It's all kidding aside. So a good strategy drives revenue. A good system saves cost and drives operating margin. And a good design will create a differentiated experience that will attract more customers. Um, so, you know, we think about great features, increases sales and productivity. This is kind of things that we think about in business systems. So when we implement these types of systems and take the due diligence and time to do them right, um, they make a great impact across the organization, right? However, if, we, if we're picking the right system for the right application, well, yeah, let me go. Picking the right system for the right application is like picking the right tool for the right job. You know, we've heard that analogy a hundred times, right? And it doesn't mean that it has to be expensive or take months and months of implementation time to start adding value to the organization, right? If we pick the right system, we can start seeing that value added almost immediately. And so um, when, we're, when we're working with legal, again, a lot of times, I totally understand, like, uh, you know, we're not the only one with acronyms, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, being able to convey technical terms and non-technical English so that everybody can understand them and understand like the value prop and and what the ROI you know the ROI is across the organization for whatever we're we're proposing as a solution to meet those challenges uh, and having a, a a thought partner along the way uh, with legal that can represent that and sell that and then and then help us to make that successful um, that's just one aspect of of but a very important aspect of making these changes, right? And making meaningful changes that both affect internal and external customers, right? So. Yeah, fair enough. And I, I think we can all relate, right? So I think um, Matt in the comments said, uh, you know, notwithstanding anything to the contrary, <laughs> right? That's a classic example. Of there you go. Right? Notwithstanding anything to the contrary. You, know, <laughs> you can explain what that means, right? What's wrong with it? It's English. <laughs> oh, it's completely straightforward. Of course. <laughs> so just as legal is incredibly busy, so too is business systems. And with no disrespect meant for any of our lawyers in the audience oh, yeah. um, or on this webinar, webinar <laughs> proponent, uh, legal isn't exactly known for being the most technically savvy, right? They are often cautious by nature and uh, slower to change, which, I mean, that's what's needed for doing good legal work. Um, and that's yet another reason that modern CLM can really save the day here. You know, with a solution like Malbec, configuring the product is made really simple and easy for the business user. So you don't have to wait around for IT or the vendor to customize the product the way you want to use it. Um, on top of that, integrating CLM with other business applications like Salesforce or Kupa is done through a literal drag and drop interface with no need for technical resources to accomplish the integration. And really no other CLM solution offers that. And uh, both of you have touched on some of that. But I'm curious if you'd like to, to add here at all just about you know, how modern CLM can kind of solve some of these issues that we, we've just uh, hashed out. So I'll, I'll jump in real quick. You know, We used to store all our contracts off on OneDrive, right? And uh, yeah, so, and it was it, obviously not scalable, very difficult to actually find what you needed and gave no visibility across the organization. It, you might as well have been in a file cabinet somewhere a lot of times. Right. And then, uh, you know, you have a lot of um, security issues as well with who has access and who can do what. And it just becomes unmanageable and certainly unscalable. Um, 
we have now moved everything into Malbec as our uh, repository for those legal contracts and also link that to Salesforce for document generation, right? And uh, that has just been a game changer across all the different departments, right? Within the organization, we're actually uh, fixing to do our uh, consolidated pipeline launch where we're actually launching an implementation of uh, Melback right now. And uh, configuring it was, uh, I can just talk from experience, was one of the easiest experiences we've had. Um, we used, what was it, DocuGen previously for our document generation and switch to Melbeck, and it's been really night or day. So just a real nice system. UI is really good. Uh, the interface between systems is good. And um, so far, it's just been really nice. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah, we like to hear that. What about you, Ronick? I think the, um, I, I'll let go something I said earlier with a little bit more detail. Like we um, implementing uh, Malbec with a non-technical legal ops resource uh, speaks wonders about you know, whether a technology can fit within an organization. Uh, as we rolled in other members of the organization, IT, um, RevOps, uh, Biz Systems, other, other organizations, this made it so much easier for them to approach uh, the technology because they understood uh, you know, that we were able to get it done with, without a lot of that firepower, um, at least in, in our initial implementation stage. And once we got a little bit more integrated within the business, it became uh, it became easier for us to identify where it would disrupt the business because we had that non-tech approach. Uh, and you know, people saw um, people saw this coming from a mile out, uh, which you know we were happy to be some of that uh, experimental guinea pig kind of uh, stage for the company. Um, I, I think what this also instructed is as we find other technologies uh, to, to help continue to boost the company. Uh, no code uh, systems, low code systems, easy integrations, those every company says it. Uh, when you have to go through the process of building and implementing, that's when you really learn whether or not the, the technology fits the bill. And I think for, for Malbec, we definitely found it, but now it's raised the bar for other systems. I think that's what's become <laughs> a little bit more difficult. <laughs> So it's good and bad at the same time. That's right. <laughs> Got it. All right. So on to our fourth and final round. So I have to laugh at this one, Ronick, because I've heard this from I don't know how many others. Legal is the department of no. Or I've, I've also heard it, legal is the sales prevention department. <laughs> so <laughs> now it's your turn to dispel this myth. Tell us why that is not the case. But it's so much fun to say no. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you say no? It's just so much fun. Right. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, um, I think, to represent most legal teams that are in this space. Sometimes you say no just to be sure that people are listening. Um, sometimes you want them to pause. Uh, and that's really when it comes up. Uh, the no means let's try to figure out a way. And that's probably how you'll hear it in most companies now is let's try to find a solution. This is too risky, but there may be other ways we could address this. Uh, the, the danger with no is we're not willing to collaborate. And sometimes you want that, uh, you know, that nuclear option, call it, right? Um, there, there may be certain areas where you just can't accept it, or the, the board has said no, right? Uh, and if th this deal is gonna take it over some approval threshold, it's probably a no. Uh, and people need to hear that as early as possible and as loudly as possible. So that it, there is a power to know. <laughs> it just needs to be used wisely. Uh, when you understand and, and, you know, the legal team can explain why it's a no or why it's a no, but uh, you could do it this way, we get to a real partnership. And I think that's where um, you know, it's really helpful to approach those conversations on both sides, right? Uh, if you know, uh, other parts of the company are hearing no from the legal department, there is a reason. Um, it's, you know, we're not, we're not just parents telling kids no just to see <laughs> if they're listening. It is, there's a, there's a real rationale behind it. So explore that, right? Try to learn it. Uh, and more, uh, it takes me back to an earlier point. It probably is more of the business and the business that you're in rather than legal making up something, right? To say no to. Yeah. 
That's fair. I, I like that too, that, that Noah is there to make you pause. Um, I, I think probably every department within uh, a company can, can be accused of being a no, um, and it's important to employ it in the right place. So I, I appreciate those comments there. So if legal is a department of no, then they must be saying no to helping you out with their tech project, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you just want them to help you help them, Judas. So can you share with us how you would like legal to be a partner with you? You mentioned that earlier, sure. right? Actually, both of you have mentioned wanting to partner. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Happy to do it. Thanks again. Um, so as we know, the world is rapidly changing, right? Economic pressures, demand for rapid innovation. We have, what, the rise of the millennials <laughs> and increased pressure to deliver highly customized solutions like quickly. It, it all plays a role, honestly. So organizations need to adapt if they want to thrive. We need to be, we need to be as organizations, we need to be more nimble, more innovative, um, less cost, cost conscious, more engaged with internal and external stakeholders, uh, our employees, our customers, regulators, competitors, and the like, right? So this also means that internal departments need to be more engaged, right? And uh, with business systems, uh, basically, and be an enabler of the transformation that needs to happen across a lot of these organizations. So, but while business systems transformation uh, may be an enabler, it's not the end goal obviously, right? Um, and we shouldn't be too quick to jump from broad business problems to perceive technological like solutions without thinking about the people, like I said before, the people inside and outside the organizations that are gonna be affected by and interact with the tools that we put before them, right? So, you know, if we work together, right? <laughs> if, we, if we can work together, you and I can become active participants in the solution to these problems and in our own businesses. And we may actually find that your department becomes a department of yes. <laughs> I'm not falling for it. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I do like what you said though. I think uh, sometimes no is appropriate, but uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's really helpful. And I, I appreciate those thoughts, Judas. So, um, the interesting thing here is that both legal and IT are smaller teams that support more that support much larger organizations um, with only a few resources, right? So you're you both kind of have similar pains in a way. So this has necessitated putting up boundaries and roadblocks in order to prioritize and get the job done. We've all had to do it, so it makes sense. I think it's. Also important to note that legal is responsible for risk mitigation. So it's kind of the nature of the beast that they're going to say no a lot. At the same time, we've talked extensively about the evolving nature of legal's role in the company and how they are transforming into a strategic partner. This is your opportunity to reshape your reputation and show off how self-sufficient you are. And that's where a modern CLM like Malbec can really help. So when a solution is intuitive and easy to learn, you won't be bugging uh, business systems for help every day. And just like with your phone, which downloads the latest updates literally while you sleep, uh, Malbec's cloud-based system does automatic updates with no downtime to um, impact your business. So this means IT can support the rest of the organization that is on those dinosaur systems, right? While you show off how next generation your legal team is. So I want to thank you both for all of the awesome insights you've provided. We have had quite a few questions come in, so I'm just going to run through them and you know jump in um, if you feel inspired to answer. So this question comes from Alex Akers. Um, Alex asks, for legal requirements, have you found a particular development configuration methodology more effective, such as Agile versus Waterfall? I think uh, it's a great question. Um, I found Waterfall helps uh, really in the early stages of a project. It provides more clarity on timelines and expectations, uh, gives every team uh, visibility into like the milestones. Uh, Agile makes a lot more sense, uh, I think, post some of that initial buildup. Uh, you want to get to requirements. If you go back to requirements, this makes sense. But at some point, 
uh, you you do need to make forward progress on the on on the implementation. So my suggestion, maybe what we found work uh, it works uh, pretty well in our uh, implementations is that you take that waterfall approach initially. Uh, you get to milestone A or B. Maybe that's go live with one team, one process, whatever it might be. Then you institute some of the more agile workflows, uh, going back into requirements, doing a phase two, phase three of the same implementation so that you get the use case really well baked. Uh, you understand what your dependencies are, whether there's an impact on the business that you didn't really consider. Uh, this largely goes to uh, the volume of implementations that most companies have had to do. Uh, in technology in, uh, during the pandemic. I think in the past two years, we've uh, we've taken on a lot of new technology, a lot of new process, a lot of new people. Uh, and it, it does mean that you, you have to be a bit more structured in your approach. My preference has always been to start agile and end agile. Uh, and we found that the waterfall approach in uh, uh, discrete segments of your process can really help you make, uh, you know, make like the value uh, be seen in the tool, build trust, and then go back and say, let's reinvest with Agile. Okay. Um, and then Alex had one additional question. So in terms of change management, what have been some successful tactics you've used for successfully launching a CLM platform? And maybe both of you could answer here since you both have experience with this. Charlotte, you can go ahead and go first. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'd like I'd say um, having a strategy uh, for CLM is really important. Uh, what is the um, what is the change that you're trying to see uh, in the company? What processes are going to be affected? Uh, and communicating some of that change right up front with people. You, uh, what this what this means for their workload what this means for their future hiring needs and how their process may need to be re-envisioned, I think are all important uh, questions to be asked or maybe prompts to uh, seed with different departments across the company. I think those are really important to do. Um, it's also like in change management, if you don't, um, if you don't practice a level of empathy, and we talked about this a little bit, um, if you don't practice this empathy uh, going into these processes, how how are different teams affected uh, when you introduce a CLM or introduce any sort of change? Uh, if you don't practice that, learn it, uh, and then start to do a lot of those communications, it'll it won't land. You'll land for sixty percent of the people, but maybe that last person that you needed the person who's gonna sign off on the budget or maybe give you that next level of QA, um, they need to be bought in as well. So take the time, do the discovery, and then construct the change management. There won't be a person you can bring in, uh, a communication methodology you could bring in that'll solve it because it's unique to your company. So yeah, yeah totally agree with that, 100%. The, um, you know, the, the part that we were talking about earlier, actually, before we jumped on, was that empathy, right? The empathy of the end user, those people who will be interacting directly or indirectly with the system. But the change management is always a challenge when you're bringing in new systems. It, it can be any any system, right? Um, people, uh, they get stuck, right? And sometimes, uh, and we all get comfortable, and sometimes we get comfortable in our own misery, right? That's like, well, it's it's familiar. And so I know how to navigate the problems, right? And so that change management uh, is is always a challenge, but having that empathy, bringing the right people into the discussions early on, for the just you know for the discovery of the solution, identifying how it will interact with your systems, will it make their jobs easier or harder? You know, is it scalable? Um, you know, all those are so important to identify through your um, early on, right? Doing when you're doing due diligence on a solution. But then uh, being transparent across the organization about the changes that, are, that you're about to implement and how those changes, um, how you um, perceive those changes affecting people in their very roles. Like, and then uh, give them the ability to interact with the team and, uh, and participate in the discussions about the solution and bring their concerns uh, to the forefront. Um, and then, of course, through UAT all the way to deployment. Uh, you know, you need to have key, key people on each of the, you know, each of the stakeholders, each of the units involved in those processes 
so that you can hopefully have advocates for the solution uh, across your organization who will be those thought leaders and uh, you can increase the adoption overall. And that's what you want to see, right? You want to see uh, a good level of adoption from, from all the key stakeholders and users. So. Right, because the last thing you want is to, you know, spend all this time and money implementing and then no one uses it, right? I mean, that's that's sort of, we've seen that. Kind of like I talked about earlier, right? Exactly. <laughs> the very exactly. people who wanted the change don't and, use, the pro, you know, see, and, use the system. Yeah, and that just becomes shelfware, so. Um, we have a question here from Rahul. When implementing a CLM system, what do you recommend for a legal department from a preparation slash planning perspective? Ronick, this is probably a good one for you. Have a plan is <laughs> good. So I think you already hit that. Um, it, it, CLMs require a mindset change uh, or for some of these teams, right? And and if you don't embrace that, uh, maybe as a leader or as a change agent within your own team, uh, this can be difficult for people. So I think um, introduce why and connect it to the business. That's, that's principle, you have to do that. Uh, what is the priority that this is actually solving in the business? If we're behind on sales, if we, uh, our vendor contracts are just not getting reviewed, right? Um, what is the thing that it's solving and why does it matter to the business? Most business, uh, most businesses actually don't want uh, more eyes on vendor contracts. They just want it to go through and they want to be agile and nimble. Uh, so express it in a way that the business can, uh, can champion it. And if you can get your legal team uh, and other uh, teams like the business systems or uh, RevOps, right? Other teams that are on board with the why, this really helps then shape the uh, the momentum across the entire legal organization. The second thing I would do is listen in for uh, uh, the objections, uh, right? We we love to object as lawyers. Um, listen in very carefully to those that are uh, detracting from that uh, from that path, right? There may have been maybe past implementations that they've done that have not been effective. Figure those out early, right? You don't want those voices in team meetings, uh, uh, you know, distracting from the cause. But you also, it, more importantly, want to understand maybe there's something you just didn't consider. No one's done this implementation of this technology at this company, right? That's a given. How do you get out ahead of it? Is you really need to create this environment where people can share uh, ideas and and thoughts, but also be uh, bought in on why are we doing this in the first place for the business. Um, I think that's a really good place to start. Then you could do the rest of it around, you know, what are, you know, are we looking at three technologies or 10? Are we, when are we implementing it? How much is it going to cost? Who's going to pay for it? All of that stuff, right? But just really give that definition, that framework uh, up front. So then people can self-select in, okay, I really want to be a part of this. I don't want to be just a user. I want to be a super user. That's great, right? And because you've got them in on uh, the why, and that will ensure that you have a better implementation in the first place. Yeah, great, great points there. Um, Judas, anything you want to add there too? I mean, obviously you you have been involved in this. So um, what 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 sort of preparation and planning do you recommend? You know, I, I can't really uh, add much more than what Runic said. I mean, he hit pretty much all of the points there. You know, I, I would just be saying the same thing he said, but I mean, just that preparation of being able to identify, which we kind of touched on before, already, right? Identify uh, the solution and what problems is, are you trying to solve, right? And then right. having the right people in the right conversations at the right time, because we don't need too many voices in the room up front, right? Uh, but being able to clearly identify what uh, what we're trying to solve for, and then um, and how that to those people who will be interacting and and using that system, uh, we want to make them advocates, right? And uh, and the, and I think the thing that's awesome about Melvic, for one, and just I'll say it again, is it's easy to use, right? It's such it's low code, no code system for stand up, and it just uh, as far as the UI navigation and interface into other platforms. Uh, makes it kind of stand out from the rest, and so it's e it's an easy sell, uh, especially when you come from a uh, you know from a, a background where everything's stuck 
in a folder somewhere, right? Uh, whether it's OneDrive or physically in a folder somewhere, which I think we had kind of uh, a little bit of both at one time. Yeah. So uh, making those transformations, listen, when pain becomes, pain is a great motivator. And eventually people get tired of being stuck, right? And uh, and they welcome the changes, especially these type of changes across the system, or across the you know, company. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the last question I have here is from Marie, and she had asked about uh, what CLM have you worked with that provides easy and effective integration with procurement systems such as Coupa or NetSuite. And I just, you know, Marie wanted to to reiterate it, that Malbec does integrate with Coupa and NetSuite, and, and you know that enables to um, us to seamlessly pass vendor data in and out of contracts. So. Um, hopefully that helps answer your question there. And I want to thank Judas and Ronick for all their insights here. Um, oh, it looks like Colin has a question for both Ronick and Judas. Um, he says it would be interesting for both their perspectives how they make determinations to choose technology. Is it an ROI-driven decision or it, are there other factors at play? I would, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> sorry, I would say ROI definitely plays into it, right? But just like I said, you, you know, you can't just throw technology at a problem, right? Um, sometimes ROI, ROI is not the, the, the end all be all. Uh, we need to see if the solution is actually, you know, it has a lot of times when we're evaluating technology. I think one of the biggest things that we look at today is how that technology is going to be leveraged across all the business units. How does it complement our existing efforts as a business and our strategy and culture? Um, and then uh, is it scalable? Right, that's a huge one today. And then a lot of the other things, we don't want to have on-prem systems anymore, right? We don't want to manage a bunch of servers anymore. So having those cloud-based systems that are basically managed by somebody else, uh, by a reputable, has the right security in place, uh, can support our SSO you know, um, uh, requirements, is, it, it just, it hits all the marks. So we, we need to look across, there's so many different, so there's so many different areas that we look at and try to be strategic and think also about the growth of the com company, not this year, next year, but five years, 10 years, 20 years. What are we trying to achieve? Will this product meet those requirements for the long term? And how? what is the experience going to be for our end users? Because adoption is also one of those things. Like I can have a wonderful ROI, but if nobody's built it, nobody's using it, and they're going back to the old method, then I'm throwing money away. So it's not always an, you know, it's not always an equation of, you know, ROI. So. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, it's really well put. Like I, I'd say my experience um, with the ROI equation is that it changes. And if you are able to assess what you're solving for in the company in the first place, this will get you to the right metric. Sometimes it's scale, uh, as you just alluded to. Uh, sometimes it's ROI. Like, uh, yeah, I'd say for Pantheon initially, it was we need a, a contract review process that uh, won't that'll be efficient we won't be addressing we won't be saying no over and over to the same issues right? <laughs> tell us up front right that these issues are going to stop uh stop business right uh so we found efficiency was really important to measure early on we've now evolved to scale we have a lot of new sales reps we have a lot of volume coming in from discrete kind of bespoke contracts okay great right so the roi shifts over to is it is it building the business value that is necessary in the near term for the company? And as we talk about the CLM, or as we talk about any kind of initiative like this, we always go back to what is the technology really solving? That puzzle will change as the company changes, right? And so it's imperative that you do pick a technology that could move along with the company, grow with it, transform, be sure that it is hitting some of those outer uh, outer years. So if, as we do these implementations, I mean, I'm sure if we did this 10 years ago, we would have chosen some very different technology than we would have chosen 10 months ago. And, and so just continue to go back and assess, like, what is that ROI proposition for, for the technology? Is it actually meeting the needs? Awesome. And then Colin has a follow-up here. He says, how does use of data analytics play into your daily job functions. What are these KPIs? Ronick, I know you love to, to talk about this. This is a passion of yours. Oh my God, I love it. Yeah, KPIs like get me going. So we've um, we've installed uh, 
a really good practice, let's say, within the company. And um, just be sure as you select your KPIs that there's a common language, right? This is, again, one of those slippery slopes that you start doing analytics because you think it's cool. Uh, the rest of the company may not follow and it might not land the way that you need it to, right? So move at the same pace. It just may be a little bit faster than other parts of the uh, the company. And this will really help inform what are those KPIs. So I, I could talk about some of mine just to, to help guide a little bit. Uh, turnaround time was really important for us uh, early on. So we measured quarter over quarter efficiency uh, on same level of deal risk. Uh, so any given contract, were you able to get it through the system faster, right? Were people receiving the value that they wanted? TAT was really important up front. Then we got to uh, per person on the legal team, how much volume are they able to support? That was all about legal team efficiency, GNA. Are we driving down kind of GNA overall costs, right? Uh, as we scale up the legal function, i.e., is the technology helping the people do things in the process better, right? Um, all of those things had to tie together. So just think about what it is that you're solving for, common language, uh, and then introduce the KPIs. As you introduce those KPIs, create a cadence for when you're going to update them and update the, uh, as you talk about Malbec, for instance, with your company, attach those KPIs to it. Is it working? Yes, I know because of these KPIs. Where is it going to go in the future? Here's where I think it's going to go. Here's what I think it's going to solve for. Do you agree? Let's reinvest and make sure that it gets there. That's really helpful. Judith, anything you want to add there? Yeah, you know, analytics, I, I love analytics myself. You know, we've implemented those across our company as well. We de definitely measure KPIs across the different business units. Um, <clears throat> and it's become very important that it's become part of the executive leadership meeting. Uh, we also have meetings with staff and uh, measure these. But, you know, we always caution against, you know, if you're measuring something because it's cool and not actionable, then you might as well not have measure it, right? So when you're thinking about the metrics that you want to measure and the KPIs that you want to, you know, gauge your business from, make sure that you're thinking uh, that, you know, make sure that when you're thinking of those and developing them, that they're actually actionable, not just because they're neat to collect, right? Because that's a wasted effort and that's what we found. Yeah, great points there. You know, no, no need to um, track vanity metrics. They need to be real. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both. Um, this has been so helpful and insightful. And I think everyone's still relatively alive at the end of this uh, knockdown drag up. <laughs> thank you, Judas Ronick. Thank you, Colin, for having us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, Ronick, Becky, Judas, uh, appreciate a follow up with the slide deck in the recording. Uh, look forward to next time. And I uh, appreciate your time today, guys. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Hello. you. Good seeing you.